Right, for the purposes of demonstration and explanation, um, this is what I picked up off a relatively recent video from Keith Rooker when he's uh, scraping in his uh, saddle and cross slide for his, it's a, I think it's a monarch lathe. Anyway, what he did was uh, set up a DTI on the saddle running on the side of a, a granite square. Once he'd tapped the granite square so it was actually true to the plane of the bed, he'd then got a 90 degree face upon which he could then run a little kingway jig along the V-ways tracking that. Basically so that you, when you're scraping the saddle ways, when you're finished, the cross slide ways are at 90 degrees and there's a tolerance to work to. Now, I haven't got a granite square and they're about 300 quid. So I've got to use uh, engineer's square. And my, this was actually a B grade Mizutoya, um, which has had a bit of trauma on the end. Um, so much so that it's now uh, just over two thou out of plonk. So neither use the bloody ornament. So I'm going to try and lap that back into square but I also want a slightly bigger version so that I can work to uh, something that I can read on the DTI. Um, the tolerance on a tool lathe, tool ruth lathe is I think it's a ma it's nothing it's perpendicular to a maximum over 12 inches diameter turned so six inches of travel and it's something like four tenths so i'm going to shoot for sort of half that i'm going to shoot for between perpendicular and two tenths in uh, and in order to be able to measure that accurately i really want to be able to measure a foot of travel and then i can measure to half a thou basically and if i've got half a thou at a foot and it's a straight line half of that's going to give me two and a half tenths which is New as damn it. Um, so, I need a bigger T-square. So, some while back, we bought that. I spotted it on, I think it was on eBay, uh, 25 quid. Um, uh, it arrived, it's in its wooden case. I've not even had it out of it. But I do know it's certainly not going to be accurate to two tenths. So, that's what I've now got to do is... Get it out, clean it up. That actually feels quite smooth with no dinks on it. So we might be in with a bit of luck. There's a bit of snot on the base of it that I can see. Um, and I, I'll get it all out and then bring you back and show you what it is. Well, it's uh, three foot along the beam and 18 inches along the stock. As I say, it's had a bit of uh, water damage. I knew that when I got it. Um, but I can't feel any significant donks and at the moment I haven't been able to find any kind of a maker's mark so my plan is um, get that cleaned up and then come up with some way of checking with the base on the uh, surface plate I want to check that that face is at 90 degrees to it or how far out of 90 degrees it is um, given the weight of the thing and the lack of abuse that I can find, it might actually be all right. Um, I'm looking for it basically to, to use that outside face and get something in the region of no more than half a thou out at three foot. Um, so half a thou at three foot would be two and a half tenths at 18 inches, which is more than accurate enough for what I'm doing. Um, we'll see. Got a bit of cleaning up to do first, and uh, then I have to come up with some method of setting it up on the uh, surface plate, uh, so I can check it's square. Well, it's not the best of setups, but it's as rigid as, as I can get it. So this is the three foot straight, a uh, three foot beam, sat on 18 inches, sat on my granite, uh, with a bump stop. So basically I slide the beam up to the bump stop, and it depresses the DTI and you zero it. Normally you would reverse the 
T-square, but as that's a big, I'm just moving the rig round and then doing the same from this side. And providing that thing comes back to zero, repeatedly, and providing that that beam is parallel, if it zeroes each time, it's 90 degrees. So it is zero in each time, and that is at a height of, what, 15 inches, 14 and a half inches. Which, for what I'm doing, I'm only going to be using probably the first half of it anyway. Um, so the next job is to basically stick the beam, that face down on the plate, and then run, run a DTI along as much of it as I can. Verify an A, that it's, it's if you like, parallel all the way down and B that there's no gaping holes under it it looks pretty good and I can't determine I can't see anything micrometer measurements are uh, showing it's it's good to you know, within a thou right. right so just checking that the beams actually parallel um, it's a, a thou indicator and over the 24 inches I can't see any movement on the needle so it's, it's certainly within half a thou, and I would say it's, it's, it's probably better than that. So that's cost me 25 quid for a three foot uh, machinist square that's good to within half a thou. I'm happy with that. Same test, but on my suspected knackered uh, Mitutoya T. So we set it up, we've got a bump stop, thou indicator. So I've got two, two thou this side. I'm bearing in mind that I've deburred it and uh, so I know it's sitting flat. And I've got a thou and a half that side. So roughly, roughly. If I now move that to zero that side. You can pretty much tell it ain't square. I've already verified that the, the beam is parallel so I know it's not wear on that but I mean it's if you looked if I show if, I, if I'd have showed you the uh, degree of dints on the uh, the beam you'll see where it's been dropped several times and it's thrown it out so it's somewhere in the region of two to three thou out which is near as bloody useless for that size of a t-square right out decide now what to do with it. Well, it's Sunday morning, early March. We've had a dump, well, you can see we've had a dump of snow overnight and it's uh, sleeting now. Uh, just out with the dogs and thinking about progressing the compound slide and taper turning attachment. All needs scraping him. So that's the job when we get back. We've got a plan worked out, which I'll cover in a second. And the uh, plan is get it all roughed in and then uh, check the alignment with the newly checked and verified uh, three foot square. Engineer square, not square feet. <laughs> well, I thought we'd have a look at the uh, saddle and cross slide and taper turning attachment assembly. Uh, try and work out a plan of action for basically scraping in the ways on it. So we know we've got the underside ones which fits to the bed, which we've got to scrape down. And they want to be coplanar with each other and a match to the lathe. So we've got to print those on the lathe bed. We've then got the various slides built on here. So we've got, that's the cross slide with a, with a, a prism gib. Then we've got the taper turning attachment, which is matched to that, but also matched to this. Now, as we've seen on the measurements, there's not a great deal of variation between on the across this point. I it's under half a thou, so a tickle up should do that. Um, so we'll probably print that with a straight edge and then print that with a straight edge, bring them to and just make sure that we've got an even gap all the way down and then tickle up the uh, gib that's in there. 
The problem I've got is printing that bit and that bit, which is the full length, and they're 17 inches length, and they want to be co-planar to each other. There's no, no, no advantage, in fact it's a disadvantage for the rest of it, if I end up printing it with, say, a straight edge, and even though it could be level, it could be consistent at the same level, if this one actually is running higher, it's going to then throw me out on this face, so that I'd end up with my cross slide um, presenting a pissed up surface for the compound slide to, to move on. So as you move the compound around, the tool light's going to change. So I want to try and keep the whole thing all flat and even. Now, I'll re from the quick scan I gave again, uh, uh, from the quick scan I had of Connolly's book, he talks about working from the top down. Uh, now I'm not looking at the compound at this stage, um, but working from the top down, I would do those two faces to those two faces, and then those two to those two. The problem is, I've got no means of printing that surface against that surface when it's got a bloody great big lump in the middle. So either I've misunderstood what Connolly's going on about, or uh, he must have a better way of doing it than I have. So what I'm thinking of doing is printing that surface on a surface plate to give me a nice bearing contact all the way across. And there isn't, there's already signs, the signs are scraping on it, so it's not horrendously worn. So once I've printed that, I've then got a flat plane across the width of the saddle. So I can then actually get some better measurements for the, the ways underneath it, um, rather than the rough and ready that I've done. So if I print that first, bring that into alignment, I can then use that surf, those two surfaces to print the underside of these two. That then brings me to the next thing of printing this to this. So again, if I print that to the surface plate, so these then two surfaces are printed through and coplanar, it still leaves me the problem of printing those two. Now again, that's unless you're using the taper turn attachment, that stays stationary, which is why we've got the compressed wear area in this section. Um, you've also got this uh, the short taper to the short gib moving backwards and forwards isn't in contact with the lower half here. It's only in con that the piece that's actually the bearing surface is this last inch here. So you've got that face and then this last last bit here. So I think that what I'll end up doing is some combination of measurements there to keep me parallel so I'm not going uphill with it or downhill or humped. So it could be flat and coplanar to the undersurface. And then the same on this side. So I'd then be printing that with a straight edge and maintaining its the thickness of it so that it's then has to be coplanar on that side. So it's going to be a bit of um, an interesting one that. Um, I dare say there are other ways of doing it. Um, I'm trying to work out a solution based on what I know, what kit I've got and what I think I can accomplish. So yeah, bit of a long explanation, but uh, it's took me quite a bit of edge scratching just to work out a sequencing. Because because this is such a short surface, I can't scrape that flat and then go ahead and I'd be step printing it forever and a day. So I want something which is going to be a better uh, solution to that. Of course, the other option would be once that while well, that's out of the way, if I've printed these two off the surface plate, I should in theory be able to take that out, flip it over and print it. I've not looked at that yet, but that might be another way of giving me a, a, a print all the way across. Six minutes, blummy. But it takes longer than that to do. So that's just uh, showing the other option for printing it so I could print both sides at the same time. I've reversed that piece and inverted it. So I've got good coverage down that way and I've got full coverage over the contact area over that side. 
So providing I make those two good via a surface plate, uh, that would give me a, a then, a, if you like, a reference to print both of those. So that might be the easier way of doing it. Uh, I still need to do make sure the parallel, um, i.e., that that depth. But that's a micrometer measurement. That's not going to uh, be too tricky. Yeah, we now have a plan. There's a, a lot of ink down. You can see the hinging of it, yeah? It's hinging somewhere around here. And uh, so we know it's not flat. So let's see how it is. So you can see hard area there, hard area there, and tiny little bit at the far end there. So that's how it's printing. So there's nothing there, tiny little bit on here. That's the second rub and all I did was took that burr out. It doesn't rock now and it hinges about right so I'm just going to give that a bit of a tickle up and uh, do that once I've got everything cleaned up again. So we're uh, blah, 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 four cycles in. It's a bit heavy at this end, and then we're not got touching anywhere. So a bit more work, probably another I don't know dozen cycles. It's not far out, but uh, it'll be better when it's done. Well, those of you that follow my Instagram account will have seen many of these walks. Some in snow, some in glorious sunshine. Not so many in peeing down rain. Foam don't like it. This is one of our favoured ones. It's up and out of the way. It's a little bit higher than a lot of them. So the snows generally gets a bit deeper. And the dogs love it. There's no view because we're in thick low cloud. We walk up through the plantation and then we get up onto the ridge. Nice part of the world. This has had uh, four and a half hours and I'm calling it done. I mean, I could mess about for a, a bit longer and get a more even distribution, but it's not bloody far off. Um, and given that it's it only moves when the taper turning is in operation, uh, it's good and flat. Uh, it's not that deep. I think we're about uh, four tenths, so it's under half a thou deep, um, which you could argue could be better. But I'm going to flake the mating face. Yeah, first face is done. Well, we've been along the ridge, we're now working our way back down, and it's uh, it's wet. And as soon as the snow hits, it's uh, melting off me. <laughs> Trevor looks all, like, looking a bit like a yak. Yeah. The sky's disappeared off somewhere. Anyway, we've got to work our way through that lot next. I do love the peace and quiet when it snows. He just loves the snow and being out. So that's the first print for the uh, taper slide. 
so it's touching at the saw ends um, and as it run as this end runs off you can feel it dropping down so I know there's a I might do a another print just to highlight that area on the ends because when it's actually in place I think this is 18 inches and the other and the mating piece is 17 or well, this might even be 18 and a half so I know that when this is flush at the end there's an inch and a half or something over there so all of this section is worn and that's not as worn as much anyway so that's the, the mating faces you can see the area of print and it's picked it up put the ink up off the end there jolly goodly so we're scraping the mating face to the saddle and uh, it was evidently worn more than I'd uh, anticipated um, so this this was the leading edge so this is the edge that gets shoved down with the uh, cutting forces and basically all of that sections about a thou below that one um, it's getting slightly complicated because you see this silver line there that is the edge of that contact area and then you've got the gib that sits there and the gib isn't in contact with that so it's a clearance face it's just a case of making sure when I'm scraping that I actually keep scraping all the way across just to drop that face so it doesn't become a problem later on the other ones are pretty much flat all the way across it's just sitting higher than this point so that's got to keep coming down as I'm going along yeah still scratch 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 it would be fair to say that this is taking far too long for the amount of wear that was on it um, I'm two-thirds coverage and I've still got probably about a thou drop between here and here yeah tedious um, not entirely sure why I've cocked up but uh, it just seemed to be taking a long time I'm slowly working my way across it though um, yeah hey ho scratch 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 right uh, I got it to the stage where it's printing about 80% along on its mating face and then nothing and what I've found is I'm picking up on this so I've got to take that off and that's got to have a 20 thou taken off that face you can see it's picked up to here that's annoying but at least I found it now well I've had a good think about it and uh, the long and the short of it there's two, two errors uh, that I've made which has slowed up progress on this and the first one um, this the section I penned in there sits above the gib which is a as I showed earlier a prism gib so it's tapered on both sides and as you screw these fixings down the gib moves that way which pulls on the on the well as you screw them up this way actually it clamps in there because it's wedged against a, a, an angled face here anyway um the problem was I I didn't scrape back enough so as I dropped this edge this rear edge was picking up and you can still see it now but that's a very very light inking on the uh, plate and you can see there's still a bit too much contact along the edge of that uh, strip which is why I've inked it so I'm just going to take it all off another another scra heavy scrape um, that was the first error. The second one was the um, the boss on the end of that. Um, when I sighted through, I could see daylight all the way across. But as I progressed scraping it, I hadn't fully appreciated that the thing was actually, um, for want of a better phrase, diving over towards that side, which is why it was picking up on on the edge of that boss. Um, couple of things that I've noticed in terms of the wear pattern on it the, the leading edge is worn but I think at some stage either on the original manufacturing or in a subsequent re-scrape of just the uh, compound or just this assembly the section sort of three four inches 
in, this section had been relieved quite heavily. Um, I didn't notice it when I started printing it all, for the simple reason it had worn so much at that end. So it just looked like a, a badly worn plane. And same here. But when I actually started thinking it through, I think the gib's been um, relieved on this section. And it does stack up that that's, what, that's maybe what they've done on the uh, on the mating faces here. Um, which basically led me to having it high these end, this end, a lot higher than at that end. Albeit still on a flat plane. So then when I was trying to match that to it, I've closed down the clearance at this position. So I've spent then a long time um, shifting material out of the rear faces. Particularly that one cock it back up and take the tilt so if you like when it's the other way up this is this was very low that was very high so i've had to take more off that edge and it's just been chasing that um print i guess is the one if one of the word phrase the, the print was not as easy to do so i've ended up going back to basics and doing very very small movements so that i'm not tipping it up and over so yeah a lot of waffle, but um, I should have picked up the lesson because I came across the same issue when I was doing the dovetails on the ram of the shaper. Um, the, the flat that that dovetail fits to runs alongside the flat that the gib fits on. That section was worn, that section wasn't, but the whole whole lot had to come down flat. And uh, I'd mess that up until I understood what the hell was going on. Uh, so yeah, you'd have thought I'd have learnt the lesson first time round. Hey ho. Well I won't say it was a quick job. Uh, it seems to have taken absolute bloody eternity this one. Um, anyway, I've now got the bottom half, if you like, the, the matching faces to these are now good. It's not easy to photograph because uh, the lighting's all over the shot. Anyway, what it now gives me is a datum from which I can then assess the other side. Um, I'll flip it over and bring you back. So with that uh, double cross slide fitted, uh, what I've effectively got now is what everybody else starts with as a saddle uh, with the dovetails in ready. Um, now what I do, what I can tell you is there's a you can, there's a chunk of wear here. What I'm going to do is go down and use a micrometer and mic it all up down each side and see how much plot out of plonk it is. Right, so I'm measuring up the thickness of the web there and there on the double cross slide. <clears throat> so the bottom side's scraped and it's flat and true. If we take these front corners, which are actually the thinnest, uh, from one side to the other. Um, the tailstock side of it is two thou thicker, which is what you'd, I think pretty much what you'd expect. I, this side takes the main of the tool hit, so it's being compressed all the time. So I'd expect a similar sort of wear on the moving face on the top. Um, so we're two thou out this side, at this end, and we are the same that end. Um, what I've then done is that sort of me measured up the, the changes to it. So I go from zero, zero, then it gets starts getting thicker. And we're seven thou thicker there than at this end. And then on this end, this side, it's five thou thicker at the far end. So if you like, that corner and that corner are seven thou higher than that corner. And it's sloping back down that way. So I will probably machine that off with the shaper. Um, now it's 17 inch length, I think, or 18. Uh, my shaper's 14 inch, so I'll only bring, probably finish the, let the stroke fade out somewhere around here. I don't mind scraping off a thou, but getting five thou down is gonna be a hell of a lot of step scraping, so I'll take the easy option. Right about now though, it's uh, a cup of tea time. Right, so we're just having a, uh, well, putting my own mind at rest. Because I've got, uh, say, seventh hour va variation in 
between this position here and that position there. Um, I obviously want to get those two faces uh, parallel so that as the cross slide is moved backwards and forwards it's parallel to that position which should be made and set up when I do the underside of the saddle so that that is then parallel with the lathe bed. There's a tolerance for it which I've got to dig out but it's you're talking not a lot. So what I don't want is the tool tool post coming going that way and lifting up because that's going to adjust the centre height of the tool and all the rest of the paraphernalia. And oddly you can get away with a degree that way. I think it's it, it can come up something like half a thou over 12 inches or something like that. Anyway, um, before I go chewing off lumps of this, uh, I wanted to see what effect that would have on how the lead, lead screw for the cross slide uh, is aligned in relation to that. Because on the end of this, there's a, there's a, uh, a re uh, counter bore in about that far. Um, and without looking at it very closely before, I was concerned that if that counter bore is set in the alignment of the screw, and for all intents and purposes, I've tilted everything down, the screw is going to be getting tighter at this end than this end, or vice versa. Anyway, panic over because all the screw alignment is within the, just show you that bit, is within there. This is all clearance holes and that end is at 90 degrees. So, and it's a pair of dowels pinning it in and then a pair of screws underneath to hold it there. Um, sitting it on here, pulling the screw in to the nut and winding it backwards and forwards it's quite evident that the uh, the, the screw itself bends as it's it kicking over. Now the gibs are only just slid in, they're not uh, locked up or anything, so there's room. Uh, so I'm, I'm slightly less concerned than I was. Now the actual, um, the nut, if I can take this gib out. The nut, you can just see, is started to recess there. It just sits on a collar in that hole. There's no retaining uh, grub screw or anything. So as the, if, if the screw decided to be, if we call it slight inclined, some massaging of that hole would get over it. But it looks as if I haven't got to do that anyway. But I will say that the screw and the nut are both badly worn. So it might be something I have to come back to when the lathe's up and running and I'm making a new screw and nut on the lathe. Uh, la, la, la. Other things to consider is the clearance on that gib. It's effectively bottomed out now. As I've taken this, under this the, the mating surface to this has gone up. So the whole thing can drop down. It's made that gap bigger um, to the point where the gib uh, is bottoming out on there before it's actually tightening up. So I've got a bit of work to do on that. I either take material off the bottom of the gib so it will go down to a low point or a machine the bottom of that face so the gib will go down to a low point. Uh, I'll weigh up which is going to be easier and which is most appropriate and then do that. Shoe. Uh what I was intending on doing or was sticking this up on the on the shaper and machining off the worst of the wear. I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to do it by hand because when I've uh, measured it up, most of the material that's got to come off is in that position there, which for all intents and purposes is the bit that's least used. So I'm going to take that off. I think it's about four thou to come down. And then uh, we'll start looking at printing it again. So yeah, um, quite a bit of work to get that lot done. And at some stage I've got to find out what that bit does. And what that bit does. Because they're new to me. And then we've got to check on whether we're going to have to do the same exercise on that. That's actually um, 
its its position it's bolted through there and then in these holes there are two little uh, grub screws which go through and they prevent that gib getting pulled up any further so that for all intents and purposes the, they're the clamps and they're the stops uh, one seized so it's currently soaking in uh, oil um, the next bit is, is the compound arrangement which let me introduce you to the compound arrangement because I haven't actually looked at this bit yet so that sits underneath and it's clamped through that's a fairly common arrangement looking at it me thinks that somebody's decided that the bolts were knackered and has changed them and butchered the underside of that it's got a convoluted setup for the gib which I've not seen I think that's the adjuster but it's can't get my head around how it's looking because it, it could be just a tapered gib um, in which case that'll be a new one for me because I've not done a tapered gib before but that whole <laughs> That bit weighs more than my cross side and compound on that. Anyway, uh, yeah, just for a bit of humour, <sighs> when we got the lathe, <laughs> that's how the turning tool was set into it. And no, it's not a thread cutting tool. <laughs> I don't know what the hell's going on there. Been like it for a while though, looking at the setup. So yeah, um, that in itself is quite a bit of time to refurbish all of this lot. Uh, handles bust off. It'll all have to come out anyway. So yeah. So the plan now is to scrape that down flat and parallel. Check my fits. And then uh, fit the cross slide to that. And then check, well... No, I'll scrape this for these two faces and then I'll check on the print of the angled face there for that bit because I need that sat on that where I'm getting it, um, it's, it's aligned so that then when I print put the saddle on the bed with the big T square on I can actually check that I can scrape the ways in and maintain that at 90 degrees to the ways which was where I started from that's one of the last checks I'm doing to make sure I've not drifted too far off the original uh, alignment um, now it may not have been finished scraped at the same time as this was rough scraped broad cut but it would I would have expected that pair of surfaces to fall within a thou of being coplanar to this and as it stands now I'm I, well I'm within half a thou running, running it down on the face where the um, gib would have been um, so yeah I'm reasonably happy that those faces are in alignment with where they were now the underside of that I know has drifted some way so if I bring the top face of it down parallel to it and therefore parallel to those all the way through the only thing that I can see now being a, a significant issue is the end face of that is going to be a fraction of a degree off from being 90 to that it's not a big face so you know I'd be surprised if it be, if it had registered on a, a thou gauge and then these two holes which pick up uh, there's a, a collared screw goes through one locks it into that and the other one the other position locks it into the uh, taper turning attachment neither of which I can see being um, that requiring it to be that precise that it's a uh, beyond a ream, standard ream fit shoo I'm happy to move forward now always pays to measure everything three times and then scratch it and then measure it again because you've cocked it up this one's a conundrum i know where it goes and i know even know which way around it fits 
but I've no idea what it's for. Because <laughs> it's not where the nut is, or for the uh, cross slide. So I'm a bit at a bit of a loss as to what, what the hell that, that that there. What is it and what does it do? Answers in the comments below. So the next challenge. So I've, I've flipped that now upside down because I want to now scrape what would be the top faces parallel to the bottom faces. So the first challenge, challenge is how to print it. So that's it flipped upside down and you can see there's no way I'm going to get coverage on that section and on the overlap there and under there. So we'll see how it looks reversed. So that's going to give me better coverage. Because I've got full contact on that one. And the critical area seems to be in contact on that one. Um, but that does mean that if there's any error on the other face underneath, that's going to be duplicate, uh, doubled, I think. Yeah. Well, we'll give it a go. We'll rough it in with a micrometer to start right, So with. the plan is to basically get a measurement which, of that, which is 367th now, all the way down here, all the way across. Now I know that it's actually tapered, so what I'm going to do is just read, take some readings across that, so I know where my lowest point is, because it's 367 is just a nominal figure, about in the middle. And then flip it around and do the other side. getting better at blind scraping maybe I should try it with my eyes shut next time so originally we were at uh, three well, I'll have a 370 thou thick there and then from around here we were going up in thou increments every couple of inches and we were at 375 here that corner's at 367 so that's the target dimension having step scraped it now blind We've got uh, an even 370 all the way along. So now I just need to take the whole thing down 3,000. Scratch, scratch, scratch. So we've, uh, that's all roughed in now, that's the lowest corner and it's all within, if that's zero, I think the highest point's uh, three quarters of a thou above it. So there's enough for me to scrape it down and bring it in now, I'm hoping. Uh, I've dressed off the uh, impact damage on that corner, whatever caused it. I might do that one later and uh, just blend them so they look the same. Because obviously th this face is visible. Um, I've been chewing over, I might actually make up some chip guards at a later date to fix on the back of the cross slide, keep the crap out of the uh, slides, and uh, probably make some uh, wipers. 
yeah um so that's about it for this week um it's been a bit fraught getting those faces in the first one was uh, the tricky one purely on the basis of got no datum to work from or very little and uh well i've covered the two issues um yeah that was an education so moving round, um the headstock castings had its final coat on the outside i'll go clean up the crap uh, and i've got to find uh, a gloss coat put on the inside to seal it off them it's had uh, i think it's three coats of uh, primer and it's that's all gone off now it's uh, good and hard uh, it sounds german good and hard um anyway uh, blah, blah, blah. the work coming up includes basically getting the headstock finished and sat uh dropping the spindle into the bearings i mean just clean polish them out polish the journals blew the journals up put them in clamp down the uh, top half to the bearing blocks and actually just see what we've got a in terms of contact and b in terms of uh, up down movement left right movement that'll be sort of an investigation as opposed to uh, coming up with any solutions at that stage um We've also obviously got to then finish scrape those two faces and then finish scrape the uh, cross slide that sits on top uh, in terms of the parallels to give me the top face of the cross slide parallel with the faces on there. Um, and then once the headstock's shifted out of the way from the end of the lathe bed, I can look to rough scrape in the, right, the ways of the uh, saddle which we know there's around about a five thou wear on um maximized area of is the last sort of couple of inches on the that end so yeah plenty to go up um i hope you're finding this uh, at least <laughs> entertaining if not of interest um th there's a lot of information i'm trying to put across but it's uh, it, it comes across in garbled um, got a lot of new followers, which is brilliant. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Um, I'm no good at languages, so you're going to have to put up with English, I'm afraid. Um, any questions, if you leave them under, underneath, I'll have to copy and paste them into Google Translate, which <laughs> gives rights for some interesting uh, questions. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. So, uh, I'll get this lot uploaded into a video, cut down some of the crap that's in it, and... Uh, Please leave some comments and let me know what you think. Um, cheers for now.